Poppy. Poppy. Everybody say Poppy. 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 Wonderful. That means Grandpa, actually. I am 69, so I probably could be Grandpa for most of you. <laughs> All right. It's going to be a potpourri of stuff based on 30-something years of teaching and with medical students, and I've seen them all. I'll probably be able to tell which of you have attention deficit syndrome within about five minutes when the classic uh, ADD stare goes into effect. In other words, and you're just in another, another world altogether. Okay. So, uh, is this you? Uh, you know how many times I wanted to quit medical school? At least four. You know who kept me in medical school? My wife. You know what she told me? Over my dead body, because she didn't want to get blamed, you know, for being the one that, uh, you know, uh, was responsible for me leaving medical school. So this is actually a pretty serious problem among medical students. I, I like to look at all aspects of a medical student's lives, and one of them is depression. Guys, you a lot of you are in a lot of stress right now. You get stressed, you're going to have some biochemical losses of serotonin and norepinephrine or both. Okay, and so that causes depression. Okay, and that's very common among medical students because of the stress situation. So if that's you, okay, and you're actually even saying, why did I do this? Okay, that's probably a little bit late to be saying that, but uh, maybe not too late. Um, Here's what I did when I was depressed and I was thinking of quitting medical school. Here's what I did, okay. What I did is I thought back to when I wanted to be a doctor. So I just go right on back at the time. And actually we're talking probably about when I was a junior in, uh, in high school. I was actually in Mr. Mr. Vatney's class in, in chemistry. And uh, I was in one of those types of situations. Uh, well, that was when I was thinking about being a doctor. So. Let me just go back to when I was in medical school, and particularly that first year with all that anatomy and crap like that. Uh, and I was thinking, definitely I'm leaving. Okay, I'm going into uh, field biology and uh, work with birds and warblers and trees and, and plants and things that can't talk back to me. <laughs> and get rid of that formaldehyde smell that was on my skin that I brought home every time. Okay, very disgusting stuff. I felt like I was embalmed, not the, the actual, you know, whoops. But anyway, I would go back, and actually the things that got me going was that Dr. Vadney's class, just thinking about it, but really what really got me is like shows on TV, you know, uh, they had these doctor kind of shows on there that, that I kind of watched, and I, uh, Dr. Kildare was one of the ones that, uh, that I watched, I said, I want to be a doctor, you know, I just like the way he dealt with patients and stuff like that. So I would go back to that, and I'd go back to the point that I said, you know, I really love natural history, but... You know, human beings are really pretty interesting. And so that's kind of got me going into thinking about, maybe I'm going to be a doctor. So that's where I would go back to. And eventually that would probably get me out of my funk, at least for another two or three months, and that would be another funk. Okay? And then, but that's what it, that did. Plus my wife making sure that I didn't quit. That uh, she just kept on giving me the encouragement to do that. So that's a common thing. So go back to those times when you, when you thought about being a doctor. And remember, this is one of the most noble professions of all time. Why? You're dealing with patients' lives. And so, you know, you've got to put yourself into a patient. If some of you have been patients, then you know what it feels like to be a patient. And then having someone that you're having to put your total, your, their, your, their total care into. Okay? And have to trust you. So that's an unbelievable responsibility. Which means that imposes upon us an unbelievable responsibility to learn the material. And not look for shortcuts. Let me just give you a big clue. I've been in the business a long time. There's no shortcuts to becoming a good doctor. None. I know a lot of you have tried. You know, we even have rapid review series. We have all these different things to kind of cut down on all that, whatever. There's no real shortcut. Okay? Because we really can't really actually make mistakes, at least serious mistakes. We'll make mistakes, but we want to make sure we don't make a serious mistake. And so that means that we really have to really understand our stuff. And so, you know, I want you to always remember 
you know, what you're going into. You're going into something that your decisions or lack of decisions can actually affect a person's life. And if you're affecting that person's life, you're affecting other people's lives along with it. So in other words, it just keeps on expanding out. So it is unbelievably, um, you want to keep that in mind always as you study and you say, I, I just want to be the best there is. I want to be the best doctor I can be. Okay, and when you know you're in trouble, you know that you don't, that you can't quite do this, that you're willing to ask for help. Now, a lot of, a lot of docs are really, you know, into this peer pressure thing. They don't want to admit that maybe they don't know everything. Get out of it, okay? Okay, because there's people a lot brighter than you that will actually help you. So don't be afraid of asking for help when the time comes. Okay, and that'll be probably the first time you're on duty. <laughs> okay, and let me tell you something. A good nurse will really help you, okay? On the, in fact, uh, I'm sure the first uh, CPR I did, in fact, I, I, compl I forgot to bring my, my brains with me. That was what to do on CPR. And so I left that back in the room, and I was down there with a person that, would, that needed to be uh, you know, had to CPR, and I, did, I forgot what to do. My nurse was in there, did it all for me, and I said, good job. <laughs> <laughs> said, Thank you so much. Well, it wasn't about an hour later that same person went, now it was my turn. So I was able to do it thanks to that nurse. So make sure and use everybody. You're not any better than anybody else. Those nurses are way smarter than you initially. Okay, probably all the way through. Okay, so, you know, you're nothing special. You've just been given a, a gift to be able to get, get into medical school. But understand that all the people around you that are power, you know, helping you know are just as good at what they do as you are what you do. You're all a team. And you're no big shot. Like, there's too many people that are big shots. They think that, well, I'm a doctor. Well, big deal, <laughs> you know. What does that mean? You're just that $150,000 in debt. That's what that means. <laughs> Here's another thing it means, too. Okay, did you know you pay all that money to go from a white coat that goes around your knees down to below your knees? That's what separates a medical student versus a resident and real doctor. The length of your white coat. That's what you're spending all that money for. Isn't that funny how it really ends up that way? But that's what it is, going from the short coat to the long coat. Okay, but yours, of course, being tall like you, you probably yours will be short even with the long coat. So you've got, so you've got a real serious problem there. Okay, you're going to have to have a tailored long coat. Otherwise, you'll be a medical student for the rest of your life. I understand that. Okay, so you should be happy after thinking back. All right. Okay, now guys, you know, to try to tell you a way of studying and this and that, I can only do that if you were my student. So I can just give you generalities, okay, based on experience, lots of experience. Because I was when the, when, with boards when they were like really tough, they were not clinically oriented questions. On step one, it was basically gut basic science, okay, it would no, no the 23 year old patient, none of that, it was just gut stuff. And then they decided that they had all these 4 old students in residency programs that didn't know it, a hill of beans. And so then they started putting more clinical emphasis into, uh, into the basic science. Then the USMLE came into it. It was because that students didn't know what they were doing. And all they were was just a pile of facts, and they had no idea what to do with them. Okay, that they decided they got to change this thing from just something that's pure basic science to putting clinical application to it right in the first years. Of, uh, of the education. That's, that's what the USMO lead did. They put that clinical context in there. Okay, so I see it in two different things. The first thing you got to start out with is core knowledge. Now, the, the, the thing that I would say would be the analogy, I love analogies, is a foundation of a house. This is the foundation before you put anything on it. This is, those of you that are second years right now, and maybe in a month or two, you're going to be taking step one. This is what we're talking about, core knowledge, you know, that basic, basic foundation, okay, that you're building. Now listen very carefully, this dawned on me once, I was doing a little talk to the Christian Medical Society at our place, and this thing dawned on me as I was talking to them, I said, guys, you know, this is the only time that you will have in your entire life to actually really learn basic science, right now. Because I will tell you, when you're on your rotations, you won't have that much time. You'll be working up patients and trying to look up stuff about that patient, Okay? Then you get into residencies, forget it. I mean, you hardly have any time 
to, uh, to, to do anything, certainly not study basic science. Then you get into practice, forget it, okay? You're just waiting for the continual medical education time to come. In other words, there is no time but now to establish that core, which means if your foundation is weak, then anything you build upon this is weak and will fall down because you lack the basic knowledge, the basic science. Just look at any of the textbooks like Poppy does. I'm writing fourth edition now. I got Cecil's, I got, I got Nelson's, I got Sabiston's, I got, I got Rosen's ER. I go, what do you think they all start off with? Basic science. Foundation. Okay, so you have to get the foundation in order to have something to build on. Okay, so how do you get the foundation? Some basic things, okay? Well, of course, I have to say rapid review series. I think, you know, it's, I think it's a pretty good foundation. Uh, my book would fit into that also, I would think. Uh, first aid for boys, fantastic. Okay, excellent, excellent foundation, especially this newer one. Excellent, excellent. Great foundation, you set that foundation there. And good course notes. You know, if you have some, some really good teachers and you've got some good course notes, those are things to study too. I mean, and you're familiar with them. And so those would be great things. They have great notes that say neuroanatomy. They have show all those little things. Whoa, use them, okay? So that's the core. That's the core. That's just the ABCs of things. It's just the core. Okay, now, because this is a clinically oriented and oriented exam, now you have to see how to use the information. So that's the second part of it. And the absolute key, and I'm just going to tell you this straight out, the absolute key for a high score on USMLE and COMLEX, for your DL students, is QBank. Say QBank. QBank. Oh man. The more QBank questions you can do, the better. Thousands is better. Okay, now Poppy interviews all my own students that have done successfully and unsuccessfully on boards. Okay? Invariably, the 99 percentile ones, I've actually had a few almost literally ace the exam. I mean, like, got every question right. Okay? I asked them, okay, what was the key thing that, that, that helped you most? They said QBanks. But they also did mention my book, though, but that's a point. <laughs> they mentioned that that did help quite a bit. But in order to how you use the information, okay, QBank. And because they're clinically based, most of them, okay, you've got a lot of good QBanks to choose from. I mean, you can go. The uh, one for l server is excellent, U.S. Elite Consult. I've actually seen mm, about three quarters of those questions. They're very good. I've written a couple of them in there. You've got U.S. Elite World, totally excellent. Kaplan, totally excellent. Good QBanks. Okay, for you that are, are um, DL students, you've got ComBank. Okay, uh, uh, an excellent uh, source for you. But I would also recommend if you're a DL student to also do a, a lot of you do U.S. Elite also. ComBank doesn't have enough total number of questions, so I would suggest getting another, uh, another QBank to also go along with that to get a higher score. So the key thing is, is the QBank. The more questions, some of my students, I got 99 percent, did at least two full uh, QBanks, okay? I mean, literally thousands of questions. And, and the purpose of it is to see how you can use the information in a clinical basis. So, once you've done that, and that takes time. Now listen, I'm going to say something heretical on how you do QBanks. You don't do QBanks by, by taking them as an exam. No, 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 no. If you want to take an exam it's just to test yourself on an exam, so you go and you buy the 50 buck thing for the US MLE and do that one. Or if you're, in com, if you're a, a, a DL student, you go do uh, uh, the uh, comp set. And for those of you that are DL students, do not do the A comp set. It's worthless. Do B and C. Okay? The A one's worthless. That will tell you, you know, that times it and the whole a bit and, and all that business. You're going to use the Q banks for information totally. You're going to read through them with the speed of light. You're going to do a snap judgment on what the answer is. You look up the answers, you move on to the next one. You do not take it and sit there and ponder what the answer is. You're wasting time. Your object is, is to use them as points of information that are clinically oriented, showing you how to use the facts. That's how you can get through lots of QBank questions. Way more, if you're taking them as exam, then you're going to be sitting there with 25 questions in one hour, and you've got 3,500 more to go. Okay, so the, the key is to go through them as quickly as possible. We you get it right, great. If you get it wrong, who cares? You find out why it's right, what, why the wrong ones are wrong, 
And there you go. You're using it totally for information. Now, here's what's going to happen after that happens. After you do this, you get into a, a couple thousand already. Okay? Is you're going to start seeing you know, things that, whoa, I know what this is already. You read the first sentence, you already know what it is. Okay, because how many ways can they ask a question? See, that's, that's the key point you want to, how many ways can they ask a question? Not too many. And so if you've seen thousands of questions, you've seen, you probably, your exam question may be slightly altered in one way or another, but pretty similar to that. Because I was used to be a question writer. I know what I'm talking about. There's only a certain number of ways you can ask a question, okay? And, and that cue bank, by going through more questions, you basically cover a whole panorama of things. And you get into the examination, and boy, just little key points to say, boom, boom, I remember something like this, boom, 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 you already know the answer. And that's how people get the 99% out of things. It just poppy, it's just like, it's just, we're simple. It was just boom. And there's also a couple little key words. Weight loss. Remember, I see the word weight loss, I always think cancer first. I mean, I'm also going to be thinking something like, you know, Graves' disease, but the number one thing, when they say, when they say weight loss, you're going to be thinking about cancer. So it's kind of a little key word. Painful versus painless. Painful means inflammation. Painless means cancer, to proven otherwise. So, you know, those kinds of things in there, you know, the weight loss, painful, painless, help you also, the kind of little giveaways, you know, about what direction you're going in. So I find that very useful as well. Okay, so the more questions you can do, the higher your score. Now, the ones that did poorly in my classes over the years, every one of them, uh, first of all, had lousy core because they didn't put the time in. They didn't listen to Poppy. And one night, we start in January, right after they get back from their uh, winter break. Okay, I tell them to start right there. They didn't listen. And then secondly, they didn't look at listen, they didn't do any QBank stuff. Okay? And they failed. Okay, so they finally got their act together, they got a better core, they did the QBank, and guess what happened then? They passed. Okay, so and I am convinced that QBanks is the key for a high score. Convinced, that's the key thing. And remember, don't use them to answer questions, you use them to just information. So you go through them very, very quickly. All right, this is my book. You already know this. Good. Uh, you can use it for step one and two. My students use it for step one and two, and they do just fine. Okay? That, that should make sense because it's clinical, you are in, and it's disease. I mean, the only difference between two and one is that one is not going to get too deep into clinical stuff because you haven't had preclinical, you know, your clinical rotations. Two, you've had some, so a little bit deeper there, maybe a little bit more management type of questions, but that's it. It's still disease, they still ask the same kinds of questions. So basically, in my opinion, if you've used particularly this book in studying for step one, I would say unequivocally that you're at least 60% ready for step two right off the bat. You throw in a little bold B, uh, the types of stuff and those kinds of things, and, and uh, psychiatry and stuff like that, there you go, you're ready to go. So in a sense, you get two for one. When you're studying hard for step one, you're almost you're about 60% ready for step two. Uh, just from my experience with this. Right now I'm working on uh, the uh, fourth uh, edition and we are going to do, we're thinking of doing something different, a little different uh, in, in addition, electronic version. We'll have probably the hard copy thing and then electronic version. But something a little bit different, but we'll have little, maybe little superscripts. Probably for something basic science, we'll probably have something like, uh, like, a, like a, a microscope. And then, uh, and then for maybe, if it's a clinical type of thing, maybe something like a stethoscope, and you click on it, and it would open up into more information on something, maybe something from Costanza. Maybe they, it's, uh, you're, you're discussing, we're into the cardiovascular thing, and say, what about those little loop things with stroke volume, you know, the end diastolic volume, all that crap, remember that, that little, that little line over here that the thing went up against, is this aortic stenosis, is this heart, remember that crap? And maybe we'd go up the point of that crap. Okay, and then to give you a little review of that stuff. Let's say you want something more clinical, you're thinking of ER, okay, you little click that thing and then you got something from Rosen's that deals with, you know, how, you know, cyanide poisoning or whatever, okay. So in other words, in one, one sit down there, you have the access to basic science stuff that complements the material that's in the, uh, the rapid review book and at the same time clinical stuff, okay, just by clicking a little superscript on it. So that's kind of... Uh, kind of state-of-the-art kind of thing. And of course, in my opinion, there isn't any better book company for medical stuff, and I've been in a couple different book companies. There isn't anyone that comes close to Elsevier in terms of the amount of medical stuff that you have available to you. Unbelievable stuff. 
and I've written for other people before, so it's it's like number one. I have access to it, and so uh, this, this fourth edition will even be better than the third. It should be. There'll be more, probably twice the number of margin notes, which are useful things to kind of memorize, remembering the key facts. There'll be more pictures, more schematics, more comparison kinds of tables. Very important. Very important to have comparison tables when you have two closely related things, hemophilia A, among wilderness disease. Where are they similar, where are they different? Now you're getting into the differential process, you see. I love stuff like that. Chronic granulomatous disease versus myeloperoxidase deficiency. You know, comparing and contrasting. Crohn's versus ulcerative colitis. Okay, classic, classic correlations between two different things. Okay, where are they similar? Where are they different? It gets you into the beginning of the differential process. So way more of those kinds of tables. A lot more radiographs, that's particularly for the step two uh, kind of stuff. So a lot of CT stuff and classic ones, the classic things, the double bubble sign, you know, for uh, duodenal atresia, uh, the ground glass appearance and hyaline membrane disease. You've got fantastic pictures of those kinds of things. Uh, even some of the stuff with, uh, you know, and the lobar pneumonias and all those kinds of things. Uh, well, whatever. So the butterfly appearance, the heart failure, and all that stuff on an X-ray. Just absolutely classic stuff. Okay, so that'll be in the new, uh, the newest version of the book. And please don't forget that there's 450, uh, 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 at least 450 questions. Listen carefully. I know how they do QBEX. What they do, the U.S. Uh, the U.S. only gives out what the subjects could be covered in a general, in the general part of the exam, and in other parts of the exam. And so basically what they do is they, these companies basically take every single, single subject that, that, that's put down as a potential topic and they, they ask them to write a question on it. That's how you end up with 4,000 questions. Does it, but does that mean that all 4,000 questions are likely to be on the exam? No. A lot of them, so in other words, you're going to have to go through maybe 10 questions before maybe one, two or three, I'm just guessing, would be something that actually would be on the exam. Okay, so in other words, a lot of this stuff is going to be wasted time, but you're not going to know that until you get to the exam. But I can tell you this, those 450 questions, any one of those can be on an exam. Why? Because when I thought of the question, I said, okay, here's respiratory system, I have 15 questions to write, what do I want to write that I know, that I know, that I know is something that will be on the exam. And anyone that's been in the business of teaching for a long period of time, if they don't know something that should be an examination question, they shouldn't be teaching. Okay, if they're covering every single thing in the world, they obviously don't know what they're doing. When they're teaching residency level stuff to a second year student, they obviously don't know what they're doing. So they're doing like what? what the Q-Banks are doing. They cover everything and they just hope that somewhere in there you're going to end up with, you know, kind of picking out the, the meat. They didn't bring it down to your level. Well, I can assure you, all 450 of those questions could potentially be on the exam. So in other words, the yield from those 450 questions is probably greater than a couple thousand from any of those other Q-Banks. And I know that's true because I asked my students, any of that stuff, any of those questions work? I don't ask them specifically which ones. They said, Poppy, it looks like you wrote the test. That's all I'm going to tell you. And I don't write word questions. Poppy was like taking one of your exams. Okay? And that's enough for that I know that I'm on the right track. I'm on the right track. Okay? And it's not because I'm some kind of genius. I'm an idiot, actually. My sister has one, one or higher IQ than I'm. I'm 110, she's 111. I still haven't forgiven my parents for it. <laughs> okay. So that's not exactly the highest IQ. You know, what the, you know what the key is for me? Hard work. I don't ask, tell me what I need to know on an exam. I just read the text. Okay, because why? Because I want to know everything. I want to be a great doctor. I want to be able to, to help people. I don't want to make a mistake. They're putting their life into my hands. So therefore, I owe them to give them my very, very best. That's what's in my head when I study those long hours. That should be in your head, too. If it isn't, you're in the wrong field. I'm just going to tell you that right off the bat. You're in the wrong field. Not everyone that's in medical school necessarily should be in medical school. Especially if you're thinking about, you know, different things other than, you know, being in medicine, you know, putting time in. Okay. So, that's that. All right, now let's see what we got here. Okay, now what I do here is just a little fun. Okay? 
Now, a lot of you are first years, and so actually a lot of you are first years and should have some of this background already, even though you're not maybe completely through with first years. Second years, those of you should already know these, okay? But what I'm going to show you, I mean, this would be, actually, I mean, these little examples I'm giving over here, actually, any one of these clearly could be on the exam, in my opinion. Okay, now a lot of them are biochemistry oriented. Okay, so I'm going to go through them and show you that, you know, the, the for, it's not a first order reason test, okay? You have to go through, they assume that you know certain things. Sometimes they'll even tell you what the patient has. And don't, yeah, don't you hate it when they do that? Yeah. You know, you hope that's what it was, you know? <laughs> now they have my really kindness to be, oh crap, that's my, oh crap. <laughs> Oh man, they're going to really stick it to me now because I really got to know something about this thing. Oh crap. Okay. Well, it's more than that. You know, it's two, sometimes three steps, okay? And that's what these questions are designed to show you. Okay, so, uh, so let's have a little bit of fun with this and we'll see how far we get in the time frame that we have. I got a clock. I always have a clock. Okay, students love it when I, when I, when I have everything boom times. And I actually stop in mid-sentence, okay? So if you see me, it's not that I had a stroke, it's just that this thing went off, and that's our time, okay? And that's the end of it. All right, so let's see. We've got a 25-year-old man has a chronic pneumocytic anemia associated with jaundice since birth. Ooh. He's got splenomegaly on exam. He has had cholecystectomy when 18 years old. Kind of young, huh? And he has jet black gallstones. So see, this is where a little bit of core knowledge helps. Sometimes they're yellow, sometimes they're black. There's a difference. Ooh. The slide is represented by the peripheral blood smear. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, that looks kind of horny looking. Well, so do people, but whatever. <laughs> uh, it does have little horns on there, okay? Mm -hmm. Little horns. All right, so that's his peripheral blood smear. So they don't look normal. Okay, so red blood cell enzyme assay shows a deficiency of pyruvate kinase. Okay, this is where you're beating your head on the table and all that stuff. And, oh man, that name, okay. All right. Then I'm asking you, what laboratory findings would you expect in this patient? Decrease 1,3 BPG, whatever that is. Uh, that's, of course, a glycolytic intermediate, for those of you that forgot that. Right shifted oxygen binding curve. Oh boy, the students are so great. They don't even know what right shift means, okay, versus long left. So we'll have to see what that means. <laughs> Okay, predominantly conjugated hyperbilirubinemia, or would they have a, a normal reticular cycad? Would that be an expected finding in this patient? So, so let's go through this whole thing. So let's see how what our first thing is. Okay, first of all, it's chronic, pneumocytic, and it's been present since birth. If something's been present, present since birth, you get the idea that it might be genetic. Good. Okay, so we'll agree on that one. Okay. All right, so it's chronic, right from birth, splenomegaly. Hey, why should the spleen be present? A big, because it's working. You get big muscles by working the suckers. If the spleen is working, like destroying maybe red blood cells, it gets big. Okay, it's a combination of work hypertrophy and hyperplasia. So the sucker gets with a pretty big one. Okay, okay, <laughs> Took me a while to actually pump them up a little bit. I have this little air pump. It's this little, it's this little device that I have you know, that just pumps them up when I show them off like that. Anyway, okay, now, how to call this that to make with black stones? So, are those cholesterol stones or calcium bilirubinate stones? Let's see who, who knows what. Well, those are calcium bilirubinate stones. So, what does this tell you? You already know it's a hemolytic anemia, you know, it's extravascular. Extra, let's take the word apart, extra outside of vessel. Okay, so we have to figure out what takes things outside of a vessel. Okay, so I think I have the next slide is my diagram. Okay, this is the cords of Bilra. Did anyone really even think this pumpy? Yeah, they have hungry macrophages with forks and knives. That is correct. Those are fixed macrophages. And they're very hungry. Okay? And by the way, red blood cells and white blood blood cells and uh, and, and platelets have to go through the cords of bilirubin every day in the dark. There's no light like this. So picture this jet black, okay, and you're going through here, and these six macrophages are feeling you to see if you have anything wrong with you. We have some abnormal shape. We have, some, we have something on your surface that shouldn't be there. Every single, this happens many times a day. This is a scary time for poor red blood cells and white blood cells. 
and, and platelets, okay? To have to get felt. Now, some of you probably wouldn't mind this. I don't know if you can be a pervert or something, okay? But whatever, okay? This is what's going to happen. So what are some of the things that would never make it out of this spleen? That would be taken out, literally, phagocytosed, and excreted as what? Unconjugated bilirubin. Whoa. Those of you that have listened to the illegal tapes know I'm very scatologic, okay? Because they demonstrate scatologic movements, okay? But at any rate, okay, if you have IgG or C3B on your surface, you're gone. Why? Because macrophages have IgG, C3B. You're gone. Okay? That's one thing. Or if they're an abnormal shape, a spherocyte is not a biconcave disc. And they have to fit through a slit right here to get back into the bloodstream in the sinusoid. Okay? And that's only about two to three microns. So they actually can't go in this way. They have to go in sideways because that's about as thick as they are. So if you're a sphere or you're something like that horny red blood cell that you just, there is no way you're going to get through that slit. Or if you're a sickle cell, no way. You're an abnormal shape. So if you have IgG, C3B on the surface, you're in abnormal shape, you automatically know you'll be extravascularly removed. And the end product of that, when it's all broken down, is unconjugated lipid-soluble bilirubin. Okay, so because there's so much bilirubin, then normal you'll have jaundice, because the patient had that. Okay? And if you have so much bilirubin, then a lot being more is being taken up by your liver, then obviously more is going to be conjugated. Agreed? So that means you should have way more bilirubin than normal in your bile. So what's the concept of stone formation? Simple, supersaturation. Sounds like the song in Mary Poppins, you know, supersaturated or saturated, not whatever that song is. Okay? <laughs> that thing. Okay? Kind of sounds like supersaturated. Well, if it's supersaturated with cholesterol, you form a cholesterol stone. If it's supersaturated bilirubin, you form a calcium bilirubin, a stone which is jet black. And the same thing applies to urine. Okay, if you have too much calcium in your urine, it's supersaturated. So you're going to form a calcium stone. If you believe the dairy industry, it'll be calcium phosphate. Because dairy products are loaded in phosphate. If you're not rich on it, it'll be calcium oxalate. So the whole concept of stone formation, whether it's in the urine or whether it's in the stinking gallbladder, is supersaturation. Okay, pretty simple. It has to be, otherwise you wouldn't understand it. It's certainly not to be able to write about it, that's for sure. People know when I don't understand something. They'll say, I don't understand it. And I'll write back to them, I don't either. <laughs> you know? And that's what happens when you don't understand. But I'm making a major effort on this fourth. I understand everything so far, but it's taken forever. But I am finding out answers to things I did not know before. That's good. All right, this is what they look like. So they see a picture like this, you uh, second years on your boards. This is, this is, this is calcium bilirubinate stone. This means a hereditary, uh, usually a hereditary extravascular hemolytic anemia. Hereditary spherocytosis, pyruvate kinase deficiency, sickle cell. They all end up with cholecystectomies, and this is the stone they get. Okay, so let's continue on now with our story. So there's a deficiency of pyruvate. Okay, here's the biochemistry point. So your first years are beginning to feel a little bit comfortable now, maybe. <laughs> it clearly depends on what your knowledge of biochemistry is. Okay, well, anybody know where pyruvate kinase is located? <laughs> Let me get first aid out. Okay. <laughs> That's illegal, you're not supposed to be checked. Well, let me check my, my, my little thing here, my, my peripheral brains, okay? Well, whatever, okay. By the way, you're not allowed to take those elements into exams. Yeah, we had a few students try that just recently. Uh, they got caught, yes, the dirty little good rats. We, we strung them up, but we strung them up on a cottonwood outside. So that's why we do things in Oklahoma, the redneck way. It's so yeah, we hunt them out. Well, here it is, guys. Pyruvate kinase actually catalyzes a reaction where we get a net gain of 2 ATP. Up to this reaction, it was like no net gain. So here's a very important concept here. So we get 2 ATP from this reaction. This thinking enzyme is missing, not in every cell, but in some cells. Okay. So what does that mean? That means that those cells will be lacking ATP. Well, don't you need ATP to run the sodium potassium ATPase pump? Yes. 
What do you think ATPase means? It needs ATP to work. It needs power. It needs energy. It's like eating a power bar. Well, they're in any ATP. So first of all, I see these cells swelling, you know, because sodium will come in, but eventually the cells are swelling. Then they're back and forth, back and forth. Memory gets totally damaged and ends up shrunken and horny like this. And some people call these acanthocytes, but that, that is irrelevant, actually, for this question. But anyway, it is an abnormally shaped cell. And it will be extravascular removed. And there will be splenomegaly because it's working at removing those. So we're with each other so far. Now listen, what's the concept that you learned in genetics? You learned that things distal to the block decrease, so pyruvates decrease, but things proximal to the enzyme block increase. Agree? What's proximal? Well, if we go proximal and we go dit, 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 we end up with 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. Bis and how do we form 2,3-BPG? Form 1,3-BPG. It's a simple mutase reaction. Every red blood cell has, has this reaction. It has, it has anaerobic glycolysis. Its end product is lactic acid. It has the pentose phosphate pathway because it needs glutathione to neutralize peroxide. And it has a methemoglobin reductase system to convert plus 3 back to plus 2. And it has a luberine rapoport shunt. That's the name of the shunt. That converts 1,3-BPG into 2,3-BPG. What does an increase in 2,3-BPG do? Right shift to curve. So look at this, guys. Look at the paradox here. Do we have a hemolytic anemia? Uh-huh. That's the way my little Bailey would say, uh-huh. She sounds like a Canada goose. Uh-huh. That's the way she usually does it. OK. That's Bailey. And I'll be seeing her pretty soon, because on Wednesday, I'm going to be in Arizona. OK, there you go. I'll see little Bailey. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. Uh-huh. Okay, there we go. That's Bailey. But anyway, um, but we got a, an increase in 2,3-BPG. Do you find that beneficial to someone with anemia? I would think so. Yeah, you have anemia. Yeah, maybe you have an 8-gram hemoglobin. But you have a, a way more right-shifted curve than normal. So even though you have less RBCs, you're more right-shifted, which means that you're going to give off more oxygen to tissue even though you have less cells. So in other, in other words, it kind of offsets the, the clinical severity of the disease. They love this on boards. They love this because they know, first of all, you're, you're all screwed up on what, what right shift means. So guess what the next picture is? To, un, to unscrew you up, okay? That's the next thing. So that I think it is the next one. Let's see if it is. No, whoops, I pressed the wrong thing. All right, that increase. Oh, maybe not. Okay, I think I do, but let's see. Okay, so let's just keep it. So in other words, we agreed that the 2,3-BPG is increased, right? Okay, and we have an anemia. Okay, so we're ready to go on some of these questions here. So let's look at choice A, okay? Decrease 1,3-BPG, is that correct? No. Okay, actually, what should it be? Increased, okay. Well, what about the next one? You're going to have a right-shifted oxygen binding curve? Yes. So that's going to obviously be the answer. Now that now this slide will come up. Yes, and that's going to improve oxygenation. Did you know that any of you have little kids? Did you know that their hemoglobin is around 11? But did you know that their phosphorus levels are high enough that we would have to dialyze them if we had a phosphorus level, a phosphorus level as we do? Why are phosphorus levels so high in kids, guys? Mineralization, guys. The driving force for pushing calcium into bone is phosphorus. Do kids grow, yes or no? Yeah. Are you growing? No. Oh, maybe this way, <laughs> but you're not, you're not growing this way. No, 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 your epiphyses are fused. Oh, no, 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 no. Because their bones are growing so rapidly, they can get away with that high phosphorus level, okay? Because they can push that calcium into that bone. But because they have high phosphorus levels, guess what? They have higher 2, 3, B, P, G levels. They don't need our hemoglobins to get the same amount of oxygen into their tissue because they have more 2,3-BPG than we do. That's a board question. You need to know normal things about babies, about children, about men versus women, and even more importantly, about the elderly. Of course, all of that is in my book. I deal with that big time, big time. You've got to know that. You've got to know the things that normally happen at different age brackets. Otherwise, you end up uh, misinterpreting a lot of things. Okay, so I think now we're going to see the slide. Okay, look, it turns around, so that's the right answer. Isn't that so cool? <laughs> All right, here's the oxygen binding curve, the one that you 
that you hate. Okay, why? What's right? When you're staring at this thing, guys, okay, okay, the middle one's a normal shaped curve. Okay, what's this hand? My left hand. That's why that's called the left shifted curve for those of you that wondered. Okay, what's this hand? Right, very good. Some of you are not direct. Notice this is the women answering that. Guys are directionally impaired. They still haven't figured out that this is my right hand, but it is. There it is. Okay, and so that's me. That means that curves the right. So in other words, when you're staring at the graph, it's left shifted because it's on the left side of the normal curve. Like some students didn't know that. Now, Poppy does looks at the oxygen binding curve different than what you would probably saw in biochemistry. I look at at the tissue level, which actually is what the, the biochemist should be looking at, because that's what the purpose is. You want to give off oxygen to tissue. So let's see why you wouldn't want a left shifted curve, a normal shifted curve, why you would want a right shifted curve. Okay, so let's take uh, the normal tissue level, the PL2 at normally at the, at the level of tissue, and you right now is 20 to 50 millimeters of mercury. That's pretty stinking low, because in your arterial blood, it's about 95 millimeters of mercury. So it is really low PO2 down there. Okay, so that's where we are. Now watch what we're going to do. I stink on grass. I'm a graphophobic, but I think I got this one. Okay, let's see how much oxygen would be given off if your curve was left shifted. Okay, so here we are right there. Let's go straight up there. There's a left shifted curve. That's intersected there. We'll go over here where the O2 saturation is 80%. In other words, at this tissue level, where the oxygen is 20 to 50 millimeters of mercury, a left shifted curve is still carrying 80% of its oxygen. You get the feeling like it's like, my, 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 like, you know, the, the first word of a, new, of, a, of a child, you know, when you try to take something from them, what do they say? Mine. Okay, and it's, of course, hemoglobin F is like that too, right? My, my, my oxygen, my oxygen. Want to give it? No, I don't want one to give it to you. You're going to have to make more hemoglobin. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> that's, that's hemoglobin F. It's mine. Right off the bat, genetically, they know what mine means. Okay? They don't, they don't want to let it go. Okay? They even make a hemoglobin that just will not release it. So you've got to make more red blood cells so at least get enough oxygen to their bodies. That's why they have 18 gram hemoglobins at birth. They all have polycythemia. But it's normal. Because they had the hemoglobin at mine. Even if we, we even when all those things get all changed and all that stuff, we still have 1% hemoglobin F. Okay. So there's still that element of mine, even in adults. Okay, so this is not what we want. How about a normally shifted curve? Okay, it's normal shifted at the tissue level. Let's see what that would do. Meaning 50%. It gave off 50%, it's hanging on 50%. Well, not too bad. Well, let's look at a right shifted curve, okay? Look, whoa, okay. Whoa, it's only 20%. In other words, it gave off 80% of the oxygen to tissue. So what curve do you want? You want a left shifted one, a normal shifted one, or do you want a right shifted one at the tissue level? Right shifted. Why? Because you're giving off more oxygen. Now, another board question is going to be, what is the function? What is to, how is it right shifting the curve? Well, it keeps it in its taut form. Now, I can look at that as bull crap, but whatever. You have to play the game what taut form is. Okay, basically, that what taut form means, and it says it stabilizes, it means is that it's not hanging on the oxygen. It's causing it to come off the red blood cell. Now, here's the way Poppy looks at it. I look at it as the heme pocket is basically hidden by the two alphas and two beta chains. In other words, it's hidden. I see 2, 3, BPT kind of bench pressing, you know, out those, those globin chains like this, you know, and opening up that pocket, that heme pocket, so oxygen can come off it. It's keeping it in that taut form. It's pretty close to being accurate. That's what it's kind of doing. Now, the form that's in lungs is this relaxed form, and the relaxed form, it has a high affinity. It just sucks it up, gets that oxygen out. But when it gets down to the tissue level, and two, that's where 2, 3, BPG is important, because it's going to push those chains apart, allow that heme pocket to be exposed, and oxygen peels off it. So that's, the, that's how 2, 3, BPG works. And so if you have decreased 2, 3, BPG, and that's not happening, you're screwed, because you have hypoxia now to your tissue. It's not getting enough oxygen. Everything I said is on boards. There's not a single thing I've said so far that's not on boards. 
So I'm covering a lot of different things, and I'm going to try to show you how you need to get to an understanding of this. You might have had a lot of this memorized, but you didn't have the whole real picture. Enough to really look at this thing. You want to be able to dissect literally a patient when they come in with a complaint and know what's going on. You want to be a doctor's doctor. What does that mean? That means no one can figure out what it is, and then you come in without doing any more tests and with carefully worded questions. Hence the importance of knowing the questions to ask. You all heard the story. You ask enough good questions, who's going to give you the answer? The patient. That is, if they're awake. Of course, pediatrics is veterinary medicine. You mean you won't talk to them? Okay, now, now, little one, how are you feeling? Let me try to get your lift on. That's veterinary medicine. So if you, you go into pediatric medicine, medicine, that's veterinary medicine. Okay? Obviously, you're not going to get any history from the parents because they're usually wacko. And their kids are sick. You know? Okay? Then it don't make any sense either. So they got a bunch of wackos. So you just have to just play it, you know, by, by ear or what the kids got. But the exam's pretty quick. That's a complete physical exam. It's pretty cool. Small little bodies. So maybe you're not getting this. All right, so that's that. Okay. So is this predominantly conjugated hyperbilirubinemia? Nope, 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 predominantly what? Unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia. All right. Now, here's the next point. You expect a normal reticulocyte count. Hey, guys, if you have a hemolytic anemia, what should the bone marrow be doing? Responding to it. Well, guys, we just basically finished this. So if it's, if it's, if it's and we call this effective erythropoiesis, right? And so if it is, this will just take less than 30 seconds. If it's responding appropriately, it's going to be making more RBCs. That's called hyperplasia. And some younger red blood cells that still have their RNA filaments in it will be released. Those are called reticulocytes. And so we expect to see, if you have a hemolytic anemia, a good bone marrow response to replace it. That's called uh, effective erythropoiesis. So we would expect that. I'm going to get through all the questions, but that's not the point was. The point was, do you see how I worked through this and went through each part of this thing? That's what you need to get to eventually. And the only way you can get that far and put together something that, that will help you in making diagnoses is studying. Okay, so whenever you have spare time, you should be studying. But remember to keep things in priority. If you're a religious person, that's first. Okay, if you're, uh, you have a significant other, that's second. Okay, <laughs> if you are, if you are, uh, and then medicine is what third. If you screw up the order of things, as Poppy did, okay, and I'm using the excuse, well, I'm doing this for you, you know, to make you comfortable in life. To, that when we have kids, you know, that they have a, enough for we have enough for college education. So I'm doing this for you. You know what? They they didn't marry you for that. <laughs> Right? Okay? They, mar they married you because they, they wanted you to love them. Okay? And Poppy didn't do that, using the excuse of medicine as that. And so now when I have grandchildren and I got, I got eight of them, okay? I'm Google gaga all over them, okay? I should have been doing that to my own kids. And so I just want you to know, don't do what I did, okay? Where I really never really brought my kids up, all three of them, okay? I was busy studying all the time. Okay, don't do that. Put things in the right priority, and trust me, especially if you're a, a religious person, you cannot give God. Okay, you give God the time, you'll make up the difference in between. Okay, so that time with your, with your family, that time with your God, and then medicine comes in. If you put it in the outer water, you're going to be screwed up big time. Amen. All right. <laughs> and that basically means, so be it. So everybody say, so be it. Okay, now you can dismiss it.